Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, I'm Blair Thomas. I'm the artistic director of the Chicago International Puppet Theater Festival. And welcome to the final panel of the Ellen von Vukenberg Puppetry Symposium. Uh, I want to start by saying the building on which I'm sitting, the Fine Arts Building, as well as all the other venues that we're presenting our festival in here in Chicago, are on the lands that were formerly of the Ashinabe peoples of the Great Lake area, um, which includes the tribes of the Potawatomi, the Peoria, and the Sauk uh, peoples. And for centuries, they stewarded these lands. And for this, we have our gratitude. Um, today, we have an, an, uh, an excellent dynamic young panel uh, doing a presentation uh, that is going to be led by and moderated by Dacia Posner. Um, Dacia is an associate professor of theater and Slavic languages and literatures at Northwestern University, and she specializes in Russian avant-garde theater, directing, dramaturgy, and puppetry. She teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in, at the directing MFA and the interdis interdisciplinary PhD. And she's got some great books, let me tell you. Here, Lara, the one of the foremost one is one that's really had a great impact on the field of puppetry is the Rutledge Companion to Puppetry and Material Performance that she co-edited with Claudia Ornstein and John Bell. And uh, people are using that still today in many ways. Uh, additionally, she has written a, uh, the, the director's prism about E.T. Hoffman and the Russian theater avant-garde, another book on uh, um, Prokofiev's The Love of Three Oranges with Gotzi and Meyerhold in the title. And she's currently working on a book on, on our company called the, the Moscow uh, Kamerny Theater. It's an, it's an artistic history in political times. So uh, Dacia has worked as a dramaturg at Steppenwolf at the Connecticut Repertory Theater. And she has performed herself as a puppeteer with the uh, first night in Boston, the children's free opera, Dance of New York, Bread and Puppet Theater, Underground Railroad, the Puppeteer, Puppeteers Cooperative, and Luna Theater. Uh, before I pass it over to her, I'll just very quickly say, though, that this uh, online panel is being recorded by HowlRound, and uh, so uh, and it's being uh, put together in collaboration with the School of the Art Institute and the Puppet Festival. And uh, you can ask questions at the end. The panelists are going to do their presentations, and then we'll have a, a, a. You can do this through the chat, either through Zoom if you're on Zoom, or through HowlRound. So both of those uh, ways are which questions can be posed to panelists at the end. And uh, without further ado, Dacia Posner. I don't know how long we have to be into the pandemic before we uh, forget to, <laughs> before we remember to unmute. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to Blair and Paulette and everybody else who um, had has made this uh, symposium happen. Um, I'm very excited about today's five presenters. Um, each of them has a really, I think, groundbreaking perspective on how puppets and objects function in performance and in our world today. Uh, I'll be introducing each of our presenters in the order in which they will speak with you. Um, and then uh, I have a few questions for them and um, they may have some questions for each other and we wanna save plenty of time for a robust conversation with you, the audience as well. Um, but we had a we had a brief conversation, uh, the uh, the five presenters and uh, Paulette and myself, uh, in uh, when we were planning this event. And I thought I'd share some of the most generative questions that came out of that conversation, so that you can have them in your mind as they're presenting. One was, how do the materials of which a puppet is made shape the stories it tells? How can listening and responding to objects shape the creative process? How does puppetry allow us to both see and remake the world differently? And what is unique about watching puppetry performance that's distinct from watching any other kind of live theater? Um, so keep those questions in mind. And it is my great pleasure to introduce 
our first speaker today. Um, Marissa Fenley is a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago in English and Theater and Performance Studies, a Chicago-based puppeteer and currently a fellow at the Frankie Institute for the Humanities. Her dissertation, Puppet Theory, the Mechanical Infrastructure of Personhood, argues that puppetry performs the limits of what it takes to qualify as a person. She positions puppin, puppets within intersecting historical legacies of objectification, the denial of a subject position to colonized, racialized, gendered, and infantilized peoples, and the subversion of these legacies. As a puppeteer, Marissa explores how puppetry assigns agency to objectified bodies and produces work that investigates power and its historical sedimentation. Marissa Fenley's paper today is Ellen Van Volkenberg's Disarrangement of a Midsummer Night's Dream. Hello, thank you so much Blair and Paulette for inviting me to this panel and thank you Dacia for facilitating this conversation that we're about to have. Um, first slide please. So today I'm going to share a little bit about the work of Ellen Van Volkenberg, uh, who's the namesake of this symposium and in particular her uh, production of Midsummer Night's Dream, which was the first to stage Shakespeare's play entirely with marionettes in 1916. First, however, we need to learn a little bit about a guy named Edward Gordon Craig. Next slide, please. His book, The Art of the Theater, served as the Bible for Volkenberg's company, the Chicago Little Theater, which happened to be housed in the Fine Arts Building on Michigan Avenue, where Blair addressed us from today and where the Chicago Puppet Studio is housed. The main thing to know about Craig, other than that he was a very big deal at the turn of the 20th century, is that he hated actresses. He hated actors in general, but he especially hated actresses. And he wasn't alone. The modern theater was marked by a skepticism of the female body. In his essay, The Actor and the Uber Marionette, next slide, please. Craig tells us, oh, this is um, an old PowerPoint. So um, that's all right, we'll, we'll work with it. Um, Craig tells us that female bodies are used for reproduction. Reproduction is just making copies of stuff. Uh, and copies are not art. Thus the logic goes, the female body is not a suitable medium for making art. What's the other thing that female bodies do on stage? They attract lovers. And for Craig, sexual pleasure is the death of aesthetic pleasure. And thus the sexualized reprodu reproductive body must be banished. If this was not enough to convince you that women should be banished from the stage, it turns out that women are also very bad at controlling their bodies they are at the mercy of their nerves. This ideology, of course, was not invented by Craig. The hysteric dissembling woman has a much longer history in the anti-theatrical imagination. However, it was leveraged by Craig as the reason to rid the stage of people and to replace them all with puppets. All in all, he found that the female body was distracting from all of the stuff he wanted the theater to be about. Any search for what lies behind and beneath the body's histrionic gestures will point back to the body's surface. And Craig wanted to access all those mysterious things that lay beneath the actor's skin, all of those disembodied abstract aspects of the human experience. One of my favorite words that Craig uses to describe the actress is that she gushes. And actually we can just sort of flip through these next slides rather quickly since I won't be using them. So she, the actress gushes. Craig's allergy to the female body can be perfectly summed up in the word. The body excretes things. It's fleshy, chaotic, and convulsive. It's messy and reactive and excessive. While people who write on Craig labor over his elusive and baffling descriptions of his uber marionette, I actually find Craig's description of the actress not only infinitely more detailed, but more interesting and even useful in understanding the work of his contemporaries those who were actually in the business of making puppets, not just writing on them. So let's turn back to Alan Van Volkenberg and let's go one more slide. There she is, okay. I wanna think about her little theater as a disarrangement of Craig's manifesto. And I actually borrow this word disarrangement from Volkenberg herself, who used it to describe her adaptation of Shakespeare's play. I find it really interesting to think of the, like, uh, the word disarrangement instead of rearrangement, because it suggests a reordering and recombining of elements into a new form, but one that is actually less organized rather than more so. 
I find that the material and mechanical processes behind Volkenberg's innovative puppet construction and manipulation make her puppets gush, to borrow Craig's pejorative phrase. We find on her stage convulsing, jerky, wriggling neurospatsin, which is the Greek word for marionette, meaning involuntary nerve movement. Returning to Volkenberg's work today teaches us to think of the marionette not as a replacement for the actor, but a mechanism that can artfully disarrange the gushing, nervous, convulsive body, and in doing so, liberate these characteristics that have been historically feminized from their conscription, not only as inherently gendered, but as theatrical liabilities. All right, let's see what's on this next slide. I don't remember. Oh yeah, there's her disarrangement. All right, one more. Okay, cool. Um, my work in general is interested in the ways that puppets, mechanisms, and techniques influence the kinds of persons those puppets come to represent. So rather than seeing puppetry as a technology to replace the human actor, I find that puppets can usefully calibrate our attention to specific assumptions and beliefs that we hold about what makes people believably seem like people. So what kinds of little people populated Volkenberg's puppet theater? And let's check out the next slide. What techniques did she use to create the rules for how personhood works on her stage? I'm first gonna give an overview of how she and her collaborators built and manipulated their puppets. And then I'm gonna look at two moments in her show that help us think about how Volkenberg used these techniques to create gushing, disarranged bodies. Kathleen Wheeler, who carved the puppets, quote, left the heads purposely rough in finish because the broken surfaces of the puppets' faces carry their facial expression farther out into the audience. And you can see sort of that rough broken carving on Puck's face here. Harriet Edgerton, who designed the joints and controls, added a waist, head, and arm joint to the traditional knee, hip, and neck to make the puppets more pliable. Next slide. There we go. All right, so we have broken surfaces that can better refract light and show facial movement, and we have added joints to make the puppets' bodies more pliable. The brokenness and wiggliness of the puppets aided in their expressiveness, two features of bodies that Craig condemned, but were intentionally emphasized by Volkenberg and her team. And in fact, she created two additional characters who we saw actually on a previous slide, Wog and Wag, who just say wiggle waggle as they squirm across the stage. Then we have a cast of actresses, that's right, actresses, who were selected not for their abilities to perform feminine personhood, but for just the lightness of their voices, which Volkenberg found were better suited to her diminutive marionettes. The female voices disarranged and then resynchronized with the puppet's gestures, material qualities, and theatrical role. And Volkenberg was unique in that she had all her puppeteers trained dramatically. She drew upon the exact training and techniques of theatrical performance, those embodied emotive and reactive qualities that Craig wanted to dispense with. Only after learning the roles themselves and their own bodies were the puppets allowed to pick up a puppeteer. A puppeteer were allowed to pick up a puppet, a process that she called synchronization. Let's look at the next slide. Okay, great. Volkenberg translated, transformed, and disarranged those qualities of the female actress into puppet form, no longer distinctly feminized. Rather, the body's ability to gush, wriggle, its capacity for rupture, like the broken textures of the puppet's carved faces, were all positioned as celebrated material qualities of the puppet, ones to be captured and incorporated. I will now briefly leave you with two moments where we see the convulsing, gushing puppet break down, disarrange itself, and resynchronize into a performing body. In other words, where we see Volkenberg capture the puppet's material body behaving like feminized flesh. This is at the, um, this is during rehearsal and in the recollection of Maurice Brown, Volkenberg's husband. Suddenly the forest shimmered with new light. Nellie Van, a nickname for Volkenberg, grabbed my hand. Oh, that's beautiful, she exclaimed, well done. But I was as startled as she, the effect was none of my making. Bewildered, we examined the set inch by inch. Finally, we discovered the edge of a cutout had become slightly frayed, the silken threads trembling in the tiny breeze of Puck's wings had caught the light. Chance had dealt us a trump card. And at the opening moment of Midsummer, let's see what's on the next slide. The king and queen were to be discovered seated at the 
foot of a tree in the forest. And let's go one more slide. The queen was all right, but the king was caught by the rising curtain in the act of adjusting his hip joints and became so nervous and uncontrolled that he convulsively seized the queen by her back hair and they both toppled off the mound and hung over the footlights. The nervous convulsive king seizes the queen in a moment of spontaneous passion. The fraying of silk flutters as Puck flies by and those lamentable qualities of the actress, her capacity to hemorrhage the qualities of theatrical performance rather than control and organize and arrange them. I find to be a better rubric to understand Volkenberg's puppetry practice than Craig's designs for her replacement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marissa. Um, our next presenter today is Dr. Sky Strauss. Sky Strauss recently completed her PhD in the Interdisciplinary PhD in Theater and Drama Program at Northwestern University. Her research spans devising, puppetry, contemporary circus, design, and scenography to highlight the role materiality plays in the creative process across performing arts aiming to expand beyond the usual focus on directors and actors to include stage managers and designers and craftspeople who are also present in and around the rehearsal room. When she's not in the library or the classroom, you can find Sky making magical things or hanging upside down at the circus. Dr. Strauss's paper today is a shift in mindset from mastery to material listening. Thank you, Dacia. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Puppeteers already know that the material world can be notoriously uncooperative. Exploring what a puppet or an object wants to do is a necessary part of the process if you want to bring it to life. Taking a step back from the finished puppet, there are also the materials the puppet is made of materials like this paper. The same puppeteer who's willing to work with their finished puppets, natural tendencies, much like these stories of Wolkenberg that we were just hearing, will likely find themselves similarly prepared to follow the propensities or honor the limits of any given material. My research takes principles from puppetry and new materialism and uses them to explain how other performing artists can also learn to actively work with the material world, to discover in found objects and supposedly formless materials, valuable sources of inspiration. When it comes to theory, I found Bill Brown's thing theory particularly useful. It proposes a distinction between objects and things that proved revelatory in relation to the creative process. In Brown's examples, we look through objects as long as they serve a purpose, a window that frames our view, a knife sharp enough to cut, or an unassuming typewriter eraser that is standing by to rub out our mistakes. The object's physical properties align with its function, so they go unmarked. For instance, today, if we were in person, I might have a piece of paper that was holding the words of my talk for me. Things, in contrast, are recalcitrant and unexpected. A foggy window, a dull knife, or a sculpture of a typewriter eraser that is so large you can easily stand in its shadow. I didn't catch the show, but I heard that Bill's 44th fe featured some particularly friendly things. What makes this distinction between object and thing more than a semantic game is the changed relationship that it describes between human and non-human. Instead of a subject firmly in control of an object, there is a subject confounded by or encountering a thing. What if, instead of being seen as a stepping stone to a finished product, the material itself were taken as a source of inspiration during the creative process? What does it mean exactly in practice to collaborate with a material as a thing? First and foremost, it is important to deliberately seek out 
non-normative uses for the erstwhile object or common material. Brown describes a process of productive misuse, wherein, quote, the experience of sensation depends on disorientation or dislocation, which is to say on both habit and its disruption. The devising process that leads to the creation of new performances, particularly in puppetry and object performance, engages in just the right kind of playful questioning to turn an object into a thing. If I stop treating paper in the usual way and start to explore its material properties, I find that it's capable of much more than holding text. The first thing that comes to mind for me in a puppet context is a little bit of paper mache. You might have seen much bigger examples than this one if you caught the bread and puppet performance. But the paper itself can also be great fun to play with. A pristine sheet moves and sounds and feels different than a crumpled one. A crumpled one moves more unpredictably and feels and sounds a little bit softer. You can hear in my voice how that engagement with the physical properties of paper, a sensory exploration, starts to take on an emotional resonance that could be nurtured in rehearsal and then capitalized on in performance. In this kind of process, the meaning a thing makes on stage arises from its physical properties, which become integral to the dramaturgy of the finished performance. The formlessness of the thing uses affect, emotion, and free association to create new meanings that probably wouldn't adhere to the object as we once knew it. It is also important to allow the thing itself to capture the audience's attention. The performances I study all ask human performers to share the spotlight with non-human performers. And it is important to clarify that the artists in question, like the puppeteers you've watched throughout the festival, do not see those things as scene-stealing competitors. Rather, a human and non-human performer are mutually elevated when they begin to successfully collaborate, allowing for onstage action that accommodates ongoing improvisation. This is where it helps to be dealing with things in abundance. I can play with paper in various ways on my tiny Zoom screen, but I want to invite you to imagine with me a stage filled with reams of paper rescued from recycling bins or coated in the contents of an industrial paper shredder, perhaps covered by sheets of paper or construction grade Tyvek that are so big that when they're raised up to meet the lighting battens, they can reconfigure the stage space. I'm thinking about the Blair Thomas and company Moby Dick as I give you that last mental image. Training, both physical and mental, teaches the human performer in that scenario to improvise with that mass of material, to accept that the piles of paper might make for a slippery floor, to learn to dance along with a crumpled sheet so that it seems to float or fly, or to master the ability to twist the Tyvek just so, so that at least for an instant it can support human weight, allowing someone to lean off balance or rise a few inches off the floor and do something that would otherwise be impossible. Expressive action arises out of hours of dedicated practice. As the scale expands, human control and primacy naturally fall further and further into question. But by enlivening the material and allowing it agency, the energy of that mobile human body also flows outward through the whole stage space. I've reached the end of the spoken part of my presentation, and I would like to give you just a couple of seconds with my one slide if you want to catch my citations. Slide, please.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Strauss. Our next presenter today is Kasaya Waters, uh, who is an artist from what they like to call the Deep South. They're an MFA studio art performance student at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and they also hold an MFA in acting from Ohio University. Time traveling is not only a subject matter in most of their work, but also a method of creation and praxis and pedagogy. They often push against and overlap and reject syncopation. Growing up in the Black Pentecostal church tradition, they think of their work as trying to find that which is holy, whole, holistic, and or holds within Black and queer functionality. They do this through spiritual surrealism and traditional folkloric techniques, and they have created and fostered techniques based on mythology archetypes, ADOS rituals, underground queer performance culture and visual aesthetics, and trance polyrhythms. Please welcome Kasaya Waters and their paper or their presentation, What Makes an Object Sacred or Black Functionality Through Objects. Hey, um, so I'm going to talk, um, I, I talk in circles um, and I don't talk linearly and also I speak in um, AAVE so I won't be um, adding any extra academic uh, fluffness and everything. Um, <laughs> um, um, so I'm going to start with um, a story and I'm not going to start with the slide yet. Um, I, I, my, um, growing up, my grandmother used to have us like collect, um, collect leaves in the fall and um, and put them in these tin cans that were used for like, I think they cataloged um, the popcorns that used to be separated between like the cheddar and um, regular popcorn and some caramels in any way. So those were emptied out. And every year we would collect um, our favorite, our favorite leaves. And I was, um, yesterday I was with my friend and they had some leaves that they, a plant had died and, and they started moving the leaves around and immediately, um, immediately the the leaves um were 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 singing they they made a sound they they were they were um it was almost a siren um that activated like this memory in my body and uh memory i believe is architectural ar architecture um and it lives in your body um i also will say my grandfather, this tractor trailer, um, this red tractor trailer. Um, so I grew up in the southeast parts of North Carolina, and they're all. My grandfather and his brother are always working on this tractor trailer since I've been alive. So I don't know when it's ever going to get fixed. <laughs> it's always like something's always going on wrong with it, and I don't even know if it's totally something that's going wrong with it, or that is the place that they have community in. So they always are trying to, you know, especially for a black man, you know, and being in a place where you can be soft enough and vulnerable enough. I think the meeting place of working on that tractor trailer, um, that object is uh, significant. Fast forward, I'm also thinking about playing with my grandmother's wigs, which if you know anything about wigs, they are actually very stubborn. You know, I do some drag performance. I've, I've stepped into a lot of drag performance. They actually very, you know, like this idea of like, they're getting in your, your mouth and you know, you're trying to pull stuff back. The lace is pulling. I've been in, I've been in performances where the whole wig just comes off and I'm like, okay, well, you know, like this idea, their wigs are rebellious, just like me in a lot of ways. Um, um, so growing up in the Pentecostal tradition, you always hear this phrase, the rocks will cry. I won't let a rock cry out in my name, which is a biblical, um, saying, you know, that the rocks can actually cry out in our, or in, in our names if we don't, um, if we don't praise, or, you know, this idea. Um, so I always had this mystical, like, this mystical idea that non-animate objects can actually sing, can actually cry out, can actually do things, right? Anything could be used. Um, and I was like, where does, where does, where does this come from? Um, and like this idea, the Carolinas are actually very influenced by the Congo region. If you actually do a lot of the tracing back, um, and there's a lot of um, philosophers and um, scholars, um, Catherine um, Hazard Donald, um, has a book called Mojo Working, and also um, Robert Ferris Thomas, who is an art historian, um, has a book called um, Flash of the Spirit. Those are two books that are like really integral to like uh, my scholarship. 
Um, and then also, I believe that people's life experience is there is a primary resource on contrary to what um, academia might say, you know, I believe it holds true. Um, so I speak from emotional place. Um, and I'm and I'm a storyteller, so which I'm going back and forth with all those things, but I'll start with the first slide now. <laughs> Um, next. Actually, no, stay right here because I actually want to talk about this. Sorry. I actually want to talk about this. Um, so um, Feyland is a piece that I created. Um, and this right here, the the cloth is actually a, what, what uh, is coming out of uh, the prayer shawl tradition, which is actually um, something that is started in the um, the um, like a Jewish tradition of actually wearing a prayer shawl that actually transferred into the charismatic Pentecostal Black church tradition. Um, but I, through queer evolution, I've changed it. It's usually white with tassels on it. I've actually just created, uh, I, well, the object created itself. It actually instructs me. Um, and um, so this is actually my 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 prayer shawl or what I use and performances and I activate the space with this. It also becomes a security and architectural space that I could put over if I need to um, go back into myself. And that's my stubborn wig. Next slide. Um, sacred entitled to reverence and respect, dedicate or set apart for the service or worship of a deity, set apart in relationship to action and relationship in relationship to um, Richard Schechner's um, this idea of Richard Schechner, um, the performance uh, studies. Um, he started a performance study program at NYU, but he talks about this idea of a restored behavior, um, things that you do so much that they basically that they become part of, they become things that they they do they. They you you they become things that you do often and so like showing that you're so he has this thing called being uh showing uh showing that you're doing um and then people who talk about showing that you're doing but I wanted to talk about action and relationship to set an action aside um um amongst actions that are restored behaviors but if you set an action aside. Um, that becomes the spectacular that can become the ritual space um an action that breaks this uh an action that first breaks and then repeat enough to become a restored behavior but it first has to break so it, it, that's the spectacular like if i'm if i'm talking um and i stop if i'm if i'm talking about something and then i continue to talk that pause right there becomes a spectacular it becomes the ooh, what is that throwing focus um next Um, this comes from Feyland. Um, this this object, I mean, this thing that I'm writing on the ground is actually how I activate the space. It's a it's a cosmogram which comes from the Congo region, um, and it talks about this idea of uh, the crossroads or this liminal space um, that life and death meet at. Um, and these are some of the costumes, and or, and I don't even think they're costumes because these sp these spirits are the fairies. I, I use fairies, especially because of the queer tradition of fairies, but also it allows me. Okay, I'm gonna go back. <laughs> I'm gonna go back and actually talk about my experience with um Tom Lee, who I think is probably in the room today, but I actually worked on a play called um, Holly Down in Heaven, and that was the first time I actually was worked with puppets, um, which. In the beginning, I hate it. I hate it because I had internalized toxic individualism that comes with uh oh oh I have to go toxic individualism that comes with uh you know this idea of um this idea that you have to be seen that you have to so anyway what I learned after working with the puppets was this idea that I can actually escape into the background and that and that does not mean that I am not valuable right and that also that i share breath with objects that i share breath with things this interdependency um of objects and that humans are not above objects or animals or anything else that we actually have an interdependency and a shared breath with these things and that um and also allowed me clear it allowed me queer evolution because i actually embraced the multiplicity within myself um that i can be multiple people that i am every woman is all in me aretha franklin but um but that I can like that I can that I can um, or was that when he's sorry, but I can I can be everything right this idea that working multiple puppets was like oh, in 
all of this is coming out of me, all of this is truthful, and all of this is coming out of the puppet, and we have this interdependency thing. And I can also bring this outside off of the stage. Um, um, I'm gonna skip, 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 <laughs> or skip twice. This tambourine is a sacred object for me. I'm gonna go back to the last one. This tambourine is a sacred object for me um, because uh, I activate the space and also brings back the it's, it's a sonic experience and uh sonic is actually one of those things that like is not tangible but it touches right so it actually has the ability because it's vibration to touch you um i work with a lot of feathers and these objects um that i work with so i work with feathers saw uh the prayer shawl um and also ornaments or adornments um, that that realize my gender. When I say that, I'm talking about the wigs, I'm talking about the makeup, I'm talking about these things that are realizing um, me, um, everything that I wear, all these things are first objects, all these things are first cotton, right? And what is my relationship as a Black, um, um, as descendant of slaves with um, cotton material um, and clothing myself, and having the ability to adorn myself with that material now. Um, so what is a sacred object? So I'm going to skip, you know, because I actually ran out of time. So I have 10. Oh, OK. OK, so I'm going to stop right here. Um, so what is a sacred object? I think when we when we internalize this idea that uh, that everything could be sacred, everything could be sacred. And I think we internalize the idea that we have to earn our worthiness, but actually everything is sacred and when we set apart set apart that realization set apart um being in a relationship with something and set that apart that is when it um that when that's when we realize that um that we don't earn sacredness um and that every everything is sacred um so thank you Thank you very much, Kasai. It was so interesting. Um, I've written down all of these thoughts for us to, to discuss um, afterwards. Uh, the, the next presenter today is Jess Bass, who is a current MFA candidate in the sculpture department at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Her artwork has been exhibited at Spring Break Art Show New York, Detroit Artwork, Art, Art Week, Site Gallery, and Comfort Station, and featured in the New York Times, Hypo uh, allergic art news, paste, fader, and MTV. She uses play to anthropo anthropomorphize everyday and discarded materials in order to build mimetic and uncanny performances and installations. Uh, Jess Bass's presentation today is called What is Around? Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with you all. I'm going to be speaking with this brilliant panel. Um, I'm really excited for the conversation afterwards. I've been taking notes and everyone's been saying um, it's, it's really inspiring so far. Um, if we could bring up the first slide, I'll be talking about several projects um, and the um, first two are like definitely 100% puppets. Um, and then I'll move on to some experimental um, puppets in terms of defining what is a puppet to me and what is a puppeteer. So, this is um, a stuff from a music video I did last year for a Chicago band called Moon Type. I did the costumes and the props and the choreography and video editing. It was shot at the Indiana Dunes. And the song is about lost friendship and finding oneself again. And so I wanted to work with the mask as a double persona, but also as a sense of protection. Um, and the song is called Fairy. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, in the summer of 2020, I made this uh, 30 second animation to address police violence that was happening across the US at civil rights protests. Um, so um, if we can um, play it with the sound on, that'd be great. Oh no. That's okay. Um, well, um, I can definitely, um, um, it kind of goes like ba ba da ba 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 da da. Wake up! It's time to wake up! It's time to go away! And so wake up! So wake up! And that's what we will do! And that's what you will do! That's what we will do! And that's what you will do! It's time to wake up! 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 
it's time to wake up. Um, and so I have these, um, it's a, a black and white um, animation with Sharpie um, of this uh, like kind of snow white lady like waking up. And then, uh, and then these uh, sheep puppets um, that interact with her. And at the very end, um, as it builds up and the music is kind of like getting more mysterious, um, that's when um, you see a bunch of imagery. Um, the New York Times had uh, posted a hundred um, photographs of police violence that was happening at these protests. Um, and so they kind of come at you um, ricocheted. Um, and it kind of gives you this like um, eerie sense at the very end. That's the hook. Um, next slide. Um, oh, but what I love about puppets um, is that they can like seem really cute and welcoming. Um, and then they can kind of lure you in with their innocence and sensibility to address things that are less comfortable, um, to get to things that are about real issues and real feelings. Um, so those were the two um, classical puppets um, projects that I've done, and now we're gonna get into some weirder things. Um, this is the installation view from Spring, um, from spring Break for a project I did called Seesaw. Um, the sculptures were made out of paper mache, half of them were kinetic, either rotating or swaying or falling. Um, and next slide, and if the video will work, amazing, but if not, um, that's okay too. Um, I thought um, that the Instagram version is better because you actually see people interacting with the space. It's the physical engagement of the audience of the viewer entering into the stage or the set um, that makes these puppets um, become part of, part of them. Um, and it's uh, and then it's this like weird sense of like what is the puppet and um, are the people who are entering into the space also the puppets um, that they need this the audience the real presence of the living body to make this actually um, successful um, and then the the next piece if we go to the next slide um, this is um, a video called Still Life Chronologically it was made at the beginning of COVID in Chicago and for one day. From 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., I set out to document all the things I touched with my hands, creating a list of the things I touched in the order they were touched. Um, and uh, I'm guessing the video won't work, um, but I, I can also, I can act it out. It starts with like um, chronologically, um, like cat, plate, uh, dishwasher, so like a cat, um, and there's, an, there's a, um, an outline drawing for each image um, and the image will remain on screen until the, the word has been said completely. Um, and so the whole day from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. kind of, it went from 12 hours to three minutes and like 41 seconds. And I wanted to contextualize this as being an artifact of puppeting that accumulated over the course of the day, that the things around myself, um, similar to what Sky was talking before, um, my bed, a coffee mug, my cat, my partner, the toilet paper began to control how I was moving and being in my own space. Um, and at one point in the day, I was just avoiding touching anything um, because the, the, the power of the things, of the objects um, had such an immense um, control over me. Um, and the things took on these new personalities um, and this new power dynamic emerged um, where I was a puppet in my own home. Um, next slide. Um, this is a, um, this is, I'm going to be a clip, um, of this piece I did with Silly Putty. Um, I'm interested in confusing what came first, the chicken or the egg or the puppet and the puppeteer. Um, and in the clip, I, um, I mimic Silly Putty and the Silly Putty mimics me. Um, and Silly Putty is this non-Newtonian, um, gook <laughs> and, uh, it like holds itself and then it wants to become it, um, um, what it, what it wants to be, which is like held together. And I was thinking about facial expressions, um, how when I'm not speaking, when I'm just looking um, at my face is kind of like a non-Newtonian putty. Um, um, but in the way that it falls, um, my face can make uh, the same um, gestures as a silly putty. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is um, called framing. It's a performance piece um, with over 15 cardboard costumes um, where the, the face hole was removed. Um, and um, I try to wear them all at once. Um, 
the more I put them on, the harder it is to move. Um, and my flesh body becomes masked by the cardboard bodies. Um, and uh, at the very end, like the last 30 seconds, I tried to um, act out um, all these bodies together um, that these puppets um, as one um, would perform using multiple identities. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, for this past train biennial, um, I curated and was part of Garage Sale 2.0 at Alyssa Gallery. Um, I took over this wet Camry and I parked it on um, the opposite direction of traffic. So there was a bunch of cars facing this way and then my car was facing this way. Um, and inside of the front seat, um, I placed a blue inflatable man, um, someone like a um, one of the ones that you would see in front of a, a car dealership. Um, but I placed um, him because um, the, the term is inflatable tube man. Um, so I've given him he, him pronouns. Um, so I placed him um, at the steering wheel. And then the air generator was um, below at the, um, where like the gas and the accelerator are. Um, and so when the, the air would blow up, he would kind of go like, <laughs> like as if he was having, um, uh, he was like stuck in traffic or um, like he had had a really bad day at work. Um, but through gesture and air, he took on these human qualities. Um, next slide. Um, in the back of the car, I had a trunk popped open featuring a Hot Wheels collector's box that I had found at a garage sale. Um, and it had been previously labeled um, by the previous owner in pink pen. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see it clearly here, but the categories um, for um, the collector um, was car and color. Um, so I use a previous owner system of categorizing to make finger puppets of mini tube men. They then placed in the corresponding sections. So like for instance, uh, on line 13, um, car was truck and color was yellow. So I made a yellow finger puppet and truck became a qualifier for its personality. Um, but in, also in the labeling, there's also old orange or tow truck, but tow is spelled T-O-E. And I was interested in how a name also acts as a puppet does. The name of the thing gives insight into finding character. Um, and this is my last slide and I'll wrap it up. Um, oh, next slide. Um, um, but I was interested in thinking about um, what if all character specificity is erased? Um, so I took a guess who board um, and I painted over all the faces on um, the same face. Um, and if you haven't played this game, it's a two player board game where players um, each guess the identity of each other's chosen character. And it's all based on facial characteristics um, like beard or blue eyes or wearing a hat. Um, but by painting all the cards basically the same, it makes the game almost unplayable. Um, and this, I also believe, um, is a type, it's a functions as a puppet, um, as it investigates power dynamics and requires a presence of players to bring the game to life. Um, and I think in all of my work, I'm trying to get into that tension puppetry creates between control and recognizability, and that the fun and the joy and sometimes the simplicity of the puppet becomes a mean um, or an entry point to get to a stickier conversation. Um, and like Dacia said, um, for me, puppetry is an anthropomorphization of the everyday, allowing objects and things to perform and take a new meaning in different contexts. Um, and that's what I got. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm uh, also excited to present our, our last speaker today. Ana Diaz Bariga, who is a puppetry practitioner, scholar, and doctoral candidate in the interdisciplinary PhD in theater and drama at Northwestern. She is the recipient of a Cognitive Science Advanced Research Fellowship and has an MA in Advanced Theater Practice from the Central School of Speech and Drama in London. She co-founded Beyond the Wall, for which she built giant puppets at the US-Mexico border. Her research investigates what the minds and bodies of puppetry audiences can tell us about the ways we make meaning out of contemporary puppet performance using methods from both cognitive science and theater studies. And this presentation is where you look versus what you see, a cognitive approach to puppetry spectatorship. Thank you, Dacia, and a big thank you to um, Paulette and Blair for inviting me to be here. Hi, right, we could show the first slide, please. 
Um, yeah, so I want to talk to you all about my research where I use methods from cognitive science to understand how processes which we might not be aware of help us make meaning of puppet theater and what this reveals about the work that puppeteers do. Uh, my work is inspired by neurobiologist Samir Seki, who in the 1990s suggested that painters were inadvertent neurologists because through their creations, they had discovered principles about how our vision works that were later verified by science. Similarly, I believe that puppeteers are already cognitive scientists because through their praxis, they have developed a deep understanding of how the minds and bodies of spectators work. And puppeteers use this understanding to guide our perception and curate, so to speak, our experience of spectating puppetry performance. So I know this sounds very abstract when I say it like this. So let me give you an example. If we could see the next slide, please. Um, this is a quote from my review of Blind Summit's The Table by Tracy Sinclair, where she says the following about Moses, the puppet protagonist of the piece. Quote, this little puppet is utterly compelling you forget the very existence of his handlers, except when he engages with them." End quote. Next slide, please. Um, you might have had a similar experience while watching some of the performances here at the festival, where you were so immersed in the performance that you forgot the puppeteer, or they seemed to disappear, even though they were in plain sight. Um, I certainly have had that experience. Um, if we could um, minimize the slides and come back to me, please. Um, yeah, our forgetfulness of the puppeteers might be an issue with our awareness, so that, for example, we might have looked at the puppeteer at, at the puppeteer at a certain moment of the performance without even realizing that we were looking at them. Or it could be an issue with our memory. Maybe we looked at the puppeteer briefly, we looked back at the puppet, and by the end of the performance, we don't have a recollection of whether we actually looked at the puppeteer or for how long. But I think that even when we are not seeing the puppets or think we are not seeing the puppets, the puppeteers, I mean, when we are not seeing the puppeteers or think we are not seeing the puppeteers, we might be taking cues from them about what is expected of us when we watch the performance. For example, cues about where we should be looking, or we might be taking information from the puppeteers about what the puppet is feeling or what journey they are going through in the performance. But since we sometimes have this experience of feeling like the puppeteer disappeared or that we weren't really looking at them, we might not be aware that we were drawing all of this information from them. Additionally, we tend to be pretty bad at reporting what we have seen. And this is problematic for people like me who are trying to research how we spectate theater and trying to understand how audiences make meaning of performance. Because it means that if we just interview audiences, sure, we get a sense of what it felt like for them to be in the theater, but we do not know exactly what they were doing while they were watching the performance. So the methods from cognitive science that I use begin to cast some light on these unaware processes and tell us more about how we watch, even if we don't know what we are doing while we are watching. Uh, I'm gonna give you an example of a method that I use, but as applied to magic, which I think has a lot of principles that align with puppetry and can give you a better sense of what I do. And this example comes from an experiment done by scientists Gustav Kuhn and Michael Land, in which they had a video of a magician throwing a ball in the air and making it vanish. They had people watch this magic trick while tracking the viewer's eye movement using a gaze tracker. Um, a gaze tracker, which you can see on slide four, please. <laughs> if we could see the slide, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, oh, the next slide, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so this is a device that has a camera that records where the eyes of the viewers are looking, allowing us to get information about the fixation path, so where people are looking at different moments Pupil dilation, which is believed to be an indicator of whether people are engaged or distracted, and fixation time, so how long people look at different elements in their visual field. And this one that I'm showing you is placed under a screen, but the one that Kuhn and Land used was placed on the participants' heads. Um, and if we could see the next slide, please. Here you can see the results of their case tracking experiment. And what you see is that the magician throws the ball in the air and the viewers are following the ball with their gaze. Uh, and they first look at the hand of the magician, which is um, at the top, in the top row. Then they look at the face of the magician, which is the middle row. And then they look above the magician following the ball in the air, which is the bottom row. row. And the magician throws the ball twice. And on the third throw, they pretend to throw the ball, but don't actually do so. So the ball seems to disappear. And what the gaze tracker data shows for this throw is that participants' gazes look from the hand of the magician to the face of the magician, and then they stop. However, when participants were asked about what, what they saw in this trick, 63% reported having seen the ball vanish in the air. 
And in fact, many thought that the trick was performed by having someone grabbing the ball from above. So this is an example of our eyes knowing better than our minds what has happened because the participants' eyes didn't follow the non-existent ball. But subjectively, many of these participants did not know that they actually had not looked at the object. And this is the kind of thing that happens to all of us when we report what we have seen. So just like Kunan Lan did this research for magic, I am currently working on doing this for puppetry. I am gathering data about the gaze of participants watching puppet performances. Uh, in the next slide, please. The next one, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can see some sample data that I have gathered. And this is data from me watching the table. So the red circles show you where I was looking at with the number showing where I looked first and the time that I looked both at puppet and puppeteer. Um, and I think this is pretty cool because it lets us see if people are looking at the puppet or at the puppeteer at any given time. But what I am more interested in is the tension that exists when we are able to compare these data with what people say about their experiences of spectating afterwards. Because by observing whether and to what extent viewers' accounts overlap or differ from what they were looking at, we get a sense of how the puppeteers are guiding our perception of the performance and the ways in which we are making meaning of it. So I can't go into much detail here, but going deeper into this inquiry can give us a sense of how different viewers watch differently. For example, it may be that puppeteers watching a puppetry performance spend more time looking at the performing puppeteer because we are more intentionally looking at the techniques they are using to animate the puppet. It could also be possible that some audience members are more aware of where they are looking when they are watching the performance, displaying different levels of awareness of what we do while we spectate. These varied modes of spectating are related to our backgrounds and our previous experiences of watching and or doing puppetry. That puppeteers can communicate with us across these differences speaks to the sophistication of their techniques. And if we could come back to me, please. So if you think back now to those experiences I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, where maybe you felt like the puppeteer had disappeared, the rest of the conventions in a puppetry performance are telling us that there is focus on the puppet. After all, the puppet is an important part of the puppet show. So this might reinforce our belief that we didn't look at the puppeteer. But those performance conventions and ways of watching are very much guided by the puppeteers themselves, who through their own gaze and their own physicality are giving us clues as to how to watch, who to watch, and when to watch what. So I am excited by how methods from cognitive science can show us more about the sophisticated expertise that puppeteers have and how they employ it to create these amazing experiences we have while watching puppetry performances. Um, and if we could please show the last slide. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. And I am really looking forward to continuing our conversation. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, such wonderful, interesting conversations. I want to just mention a few threads that I pulled out while everybody was speaking. Marissa talking about what does puppetry disarrange? And I wondered as a, as a result of that, what does it rearrange and what does it reclaim? Sky talking about the mutual elevation of both human and non-human performance together. Kasaya talking about life experience being a primary resource and being in the background and sharing breath does not make someone less valuable. Uh, Jess talking about how puppets lure you in with their innocence to address things that are less comfortable, um, the tensions that puppetry uh, creates, and Anna thinking through what the work is that puppeteers do and how we have different levels of very sophisticated awareness while we spectate puppet theater. So thank you all of you for bringing up these, I think, very important, very timely, very sophisticated questions um, regarding puppet theater. I'll return to, I'll, I'll launch us today by just returning to a couple of the, of the questions that I began with um, that seem to me to be the, the common threads in your work. Um, and anybody can jump in and answer, and then we'll turn it over to our, our Zoom audience and our regular audience. And I also invite you to ask questions of each other. But how does listening to objects for you shape the creative process? And how does puppetry allow us to see and remake the world differently? 
Um, anybody just jump in if you have any thoughts on either of these things. While, while, while the folks are, are pondering um, their responses, also I want to invite anybody who's on the, the Zoom uh, call to go ahead and put uh, any questions that you have in the chat or also you know you're welcome to ask your question live if you prefer just indicate that in the chat and then also any of our how round audience uh, members if you have questions go ahead and and um, sign in and, and post those questions and we'll try to get to those as well can you repeat the question how, how does listening to objects shape the creative process and how does puppetry allow us to see the world differently and maybe even remake the world? Mm. Try to think of a way to start that doesn't feel like repeating something from my presentation. Uh, Eat away, you know, like it, it's not repetition, it's reiteration and distillation. I mean, part of the seeing the world differently part, I mean, we're, we're doing it different ways in different presentations. There's taking something we encounter all the time, the cat and the dishwasher, and having a different sort of appreciation for it um, versus in my case, that disorientation idea, can you take something that you pass by every day and have some kind of different experience with it? Although I think those are interrelated, um, but, that's definitely part of that feedback between subject and object, person and thing um, that allows us to generate artistic material in a lot of different contexts. So for instance, Marissa, the things that started to feel like they might be malfunctions or happy mistakes that can then get made into something useful in performance. Yeah, one, one thing that I noticed actually about all the papers in which you is the way in which you, you talk about navigating and destabilizing familiar relationships, and then also just a, a, a kind of a humility um, and willingness to share the world with objects. Something that I noticed across everybody's work. Yeah, if I could add on to what Sky said. Um, I think that you know my work is like also very interested in the in the histories that puppetry is able to reanimate and then often renegotiate on stage and I think part of this is because it's one that really lays bare the actual processes of creation um, in ways that other theater does not and I think you know Anna will probably have infinitely smarter things to say about how much we actually can be attended to those processes as they're happening um, but I do think that in that way um, puppetry is able to sort of lay bare a lot of the structures that uh, we do assume go into making something animate or in my personal interest, making someone seem like a person. Um, and that there's all sorts of structures that we inhabit every day that end up uh, animating our own you know, personalities and different sort of techniques that we use to bring those personas into, into being um, that are invisible. And yet I think puppetry can make them visible in a way that is interesting. And then in really uh, naming and sort of thinking about those histories, I think it can become a very interesting tool to renegotiate what those structures are and how they limit how we move, how we, how we feel and how we think. Mm. Um, if I could add on to that. <laughs> yeah, I think Maris is right, like how puppetry makes visible the creation process. And I think it also like heightens these kind of like our relationship with fiction, right? Or what we think of as fiction. Um, so because there's no no hiding that this puppet is, is, our, is an artificial life. And there's always kind of like that awareness in the back of our minds. So we're always in this constant tension of like the immersion and the oh, but I'm an audience sitting on the on the on the, on the, on the theater seat. Um, so I think it also like invites us to rethink what our relationship with with fiction and with art in general is, right? Like how much we're engaging in sort of fiction making in our everyday lives and and yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna jump on. <laughs> I'm gonna jump on that one. Um, um, Sun Ra, the musician, oh, you know, says that uh, um, the the black body is myth already. 
Um, and it's, you know, the black body has always been rendered as an object. Um, so to think of, uh, so it's, 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 it's an easier, it's an easier window to think of, um, when you think about, ob like when we think about like, um, going into mystical or when we think about glitch feminism, which offers us a way to like, um, take on characters and actually make those characters part of our daily lives and live in a mystical place and live our Afro fabulations. Like this idea of like, I can actually create, like I can be the, um, these objects are allow are showing me that I can, I these objects, especially when we think about puppetry work, these objects are allowing me to put energy somewhere that actually lives in me, and then therefore, uh, and and then therefore have a conversation and be in conversation that is transforming me into the object. Um, okay, I mean, I need to add on to, to that. Um... I think puppets keep the imagination open, that puppets allow for constant reimagination. Um, to what people were saying before about this, the creation process is, is possible on the stage, but it's also possible. And when you take the puppet home, what does the puppet do versus what it's on the stage? And that these like various lives and different, different spaces allow for constant reorganization. Um, and I wanted to go back to what, um, what Marissa had been talking about before um, with the wiggle waggle, um, that the characters, the whole entire play just said wiggle waggle and how generative that is um, um, and how that, that, says, that says enough and that you still understand um, all, all of the different means of what that can be within a context. Um, I invite now each of you to uh, you know, continue the conversation with each other, ask each other questions if you have them. And also, uh, I really want to extend a warm, well, a warm invitation for uh, the, the other folks who are on the Zoom call and especially the folks who are watching on HowlRound. Go ahead and, and, uh, and post your questions. Uh, we would love for you to be part of the, the question in the 15 minutes, uh, the uh, conversation in the 15 minutes we have remaining. Hi, Dacia. This is Tom Lee with the Puppet Festival. We're getting some comments coming through HowlRound. And one, yeah, one is, a, is more of a statement, um, uh, that, which maybe your panelists can, can um, respond to. And it's from uh, Bruce. Um, Bruce is stating, um, uh, is puppetry an illusion? Or um, if puppetry is an illusion, and it is creating a, a reality that is not often there. How would you respond to that statement from Bruce? Hmm. I guess the question is, is puppetry an illusion? And is, or is it reality? That's a really good question. I mean, I, I, I'm really interested in what you all have to say. The first thing that comes to my mind is, I mean, it's maybe it's a reality that you make right? It's a reality that you imagine. I love what Kasaya said about it allowing you to live in a mystical place, to live out in your words, your, your um, Afrofabulations, um, and the way in which it choose, you, allows you to choose where you put your, your energy and your um, attention and your imagination, just talking about it being a constant reimagination. But what do you think about, about puppetry, illusion, reality, and imagination? I actually also find Kazaya's work really useful in answering this question. Um, and maybe it's because of your investment in the metaphysical and whatever ways that, you know, you've articulated it in, you know, numerous different terms. But I was thinking especially about like this, this tension in your presentation, Kazaya, about um, the scarf as like protection, where it allowed you to um, spend more time with yourself. And then the object is also an occasion to like withdraw from your individuality as well and sort of really decenter that sort of sense of American individualism. And those to me are like two actually opposite impulses in some ways. One is like a retreat into the self and one is a way of decentering the self, um, but that the object can allow in both instances. Um, and so I guess, I don't, I don't know why this was sparked by the question, but it seems like the, the ways that the puppeteer or artist is showing up on stage um, and either making room for things that uh, that artist is not um, 
bringing, whether it's because they don't want to be seen and want to sort of be private or because they want to, in fact, um, decenter and sort of de-individualize and really make their way into the object. Um, to me, that speaks to this question of the illusion and the real. Mm -hmm. I also think part of what we're all talking about in different ways is what kind of illusion is going to be successful depends on your ability to negotiate with the physical reality of the things you have in hand. So the successful illusion that the puppeteer creates with the puppet depends on their ability to know what the puppet can and cannot do. But often the moments when we stutter, when the illusion gets broken, are about malfunction on stage in some way or another. Um, so I, I think there's a way that those things potentially run into each other and that a lot of the skill of the puppeteer referring to Anna's presentation is about keeping us away from the things that would punctuate the illusion and a lot of those are related to the physical reality of those objects. So there's a way that the way we think of illusion as imaginary competes with the physical reality of making puppets. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tom reports that there are some more questions coming through on HowlRound. Um, before um, before you jump to those, though, though Tom, I just want to uh, to to respond very quickly to what Sky said um, in relation to Anna's paper. Another thing that struck me um, about that example, of the table, is that. Um, the, the puppeteer sometimes tries to steer you away from puncturing the illusion and then sometimes also deliberately punctures the illusion by drawing attention to the puppeteer. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Oh, really, really quickly. So sorry. Yeah. I want to just, um, just jump off on that. Um, I think, I think an illusion, um, if you believe in the illusion, it's real. I, I think this, like this dichotomy between, um, an illusion or reality, like, this is definitely like I, I'm there's tons of things that um, I think is real that maybe isn't or there's like concepts or ways of being or habits that I have that that bring things into the unreal versus real but I think to, to make that dichotomy between mm -hmm. illusion and real um, I think um, what Kazaya said before about with the puppets you breathe life into something um, a thing an object yourself and so there with breath, there there is reality. There there is life to that. Um, I, I think the for me the real question is um, it, the responsibility of breathing life into something and what you do with that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Tom. No, wonderful um, thoughts that you all are sharing. We have another question on Howl Round from Kalan. Uh, I'll. I'll Say it very slowly, it's a, um, uh, just so you know, you can hear it. Does puppetry destabilize our anthropocentric fetish? Of course, we have animist ideas or cliches, but how can puppetry invoke or better invoke a divestment from our human ego problem? So I guess that's, um, that's just throwing that out It's a great question. I, and I think it's, I think it is a really important question. And I think it's, it's something that each of you um, in different ways um, has taken as a given that there's a value in destabilizing our anthropocentric fetish um, and that there's a value in divesting from the human ego problem and sharing the world with things. But I'd like to hear what your thoughts are. Well, if I could jump in, just because this is a conversation that Anna and I have had a lot. Um, so Anna, feel free to interrupt me. But I actually think that in some ways puppetry highlights our anthropocentrism problem. Um, and it does so in very interesting and productive ways. Um, and this might be biased by my interest in anthropomorphic puppets specifically. Um, but I think that puppetry actually demands that we anthropomorphize the things that we're looking at in order to believe that they're animated. I think that that sort of mechanic that we have is a part of what makes puppetry happen. Um, but what I think that it can do is highlight the different assumptions that go into anthropomorphizing and can actually lay bare sort of the, the different systemic qualities that anthropomorphism 
draws upon and feeds upon in order to work, which are, you know, problematic as I think this question assumes as well. Um, but rather than necessarily leaving it behind and finding sort of a way to um, decenter the human, it centers the human in a way that really asks us questions about what is making that se thing seem like a human. We have all sorts of assumptions that allow us to believe it's a human. Um, so that's my personal sort of belief is that puppetry actually really puts the human front and center in a bare and raw, exposed, <laughs> uncomfortable way. <laughs> and I, I wonder if maybe that's part of the reason I'm always interested in more abstract things. So when I'm interested in these ideas of how do you follow a material instead of continue to impose what you imagined upon it, um, that I end up talking about not figurative puppets, but paper, et cetera, et cetera, which also for me starts to connect to some of the ideas in writing like Jane Bennett's Vibrant Matter um, and talking about the fact that things like paying attention to ecology, the fact that I was giving examples in the talk that were about recycling was intentional, um, that there are ways that if we're willing to follow the track of the materials we already have instead of making more materials, that there's a way to create the kind of social change that can come out of some of that hmm. shifting away from anthropocentrism. So there, that hovers around my work in a different in a different way. I think that's really productive. Mm -hmm. I, I have two contradictory answers to this question. <laughs> um, yeah, one is like, like, there's this weird thing I think that puppets do. And I actually had this experience last week when I went to see chimpanzee very clearly where like, suddenly I could see the chimpanzee think and I think like puppets let you do this thing, right? Where you're just like, well, this is not a human subject, but I can understand the thinking process and I can see that the thinking process is different from the thinking process of a human. But at the same time, of course, my understanding of that thinking process is limited by my humanness and the fact that everything is filtered by my own humanity. Um, and so I think there's kind of like this door that puppets open, but it also lets us acknowledge, as Marisa was saying, right? Like the centrality that we give to our own ways of thinking and to our own ways of being in the world. Um, having said that, and also related to the question of puppetry being an illusion, I think that even when we are hiding the puppeteer, we know that this object that is being animated is not alive, right? Like there's a puppeteer and there's a, a person behind it. So like, there is there is no illusion, but it doesn't mean that it's broken. It, like for me, it draws it more into reality, right? Like this object that is animated, it is doing things in the world and it is engaging with the world. So I think rather than puppetry being an illusion, it like creates a different reality. And so in that sense, mm -hmm. it can like invites us to, to see the agency of the objects in this way that moves us beyond our human ego. Mm -hmm. I, I also think, um... Going off, going off of that, like this idea that um, it's, it's really hard to answer that question um, without actually hearing it from the object itself, <laughs> you know, with this idea of like, can we create safe spaces when we're, you know, like the idea of if we are, we've created a world where we are the, we are the ones in power, right? That we actually have to listen to the object itself for the answer for that question um, and the objects, you know, so it's a very uh, esoteric way to look at it, but um, I think objects you know, I, I think it, it goes back to that, that the, the question about sound, like, does the object actually talk? Um, I was thinking about this also in relation to our idea of Pluto, like, it's not a planet anymore. It's a planet, it's a planet, it's not a planet, it's not. And like this idea of Pluto is just somewhere still existing and being. Uh, Tom, it sounds like there's another question from HowlRound. Yes, there is. There's one from Adam Wilson. Mm. Adam says, uh, throughout everyone's fascinating talks, it seems that two uses of puppetry continue to resurface. The activation of imagination and cultural pedagogy slash identity formation. Are these uses of puppetry connected with one another? Once again, it seemed that two uses of puppetry continue to surface. The activation of the imagination and the cultural pedagogy pedagogy slash identity formation. Are these two uses connected? I hope I'm making that clear. So uh, imagination and identity formation and how they might be, and if they might be connected in puppetry. 
I mean, I think so. I think so. I think you have to have the imagination in order to form the identity, right? Or, or reform the identity or remake the identity or disarrange um, the identity in Marissa's um, term from the Ellen Van Zulkenberg presentation. But what do you all think? Yes. <laughs> I think they're, yeah, I think they're intimately um, entwined. I think, you know, I realize like that I have this sort of, I don't know, curmudgeonly attitude that I am bringing to this panel right now, which I don't know why, but it's just happening. Um, which is like, I think I'm a little bit skeptical of like, and I, or at least I like to try to remain a bit skeptical of like people's imaginative capacities. Um, and at least like maintain that, I think that the ways that identity has been formed historically ends up being, it's infected our imaginations. And I think that the ways it's infected our imaginations are highlighted by puppetry, especially by sort of asking us to believe in the identity of a thing where it can't actually completely reimagine every aspect of that identity. It has to borrow from histories that have previously allowed that identity to become legible and to become visible to us. And so I think that in some ways, puppetry can exploit our failures of imagination in ways that can be really dangerous and damaging. And like, I think that there are historical examples of, you know, like I work on ventriloquism, which is just straight developed from the minstrel show. And you can see like Jeff Dunham still doing this today. I mean, like there are ways that it really co-ops our failures of imagination. And then I think that when it can be really productive in pushing against it, it can do it in a way that really allows us to realize our own limitations of imagination. Um, and I'm more interested, I think, in that struggle, that place where we confront our, you know, why do I believe um this identity to be so real um in a way that is actually limiting um so yeah i'm more interested in that failure than i think i am in its in its uh capacities which of course it is also true mm -hmm. i'm gonna quote um well the nat ministry which is a performance group out of uh elena started by trisha hershey who was a chicago she was first a chicago-based artist but um um, this idea that a lot of people don't know this that Harriet Tubman actually had a condition where she was where she will fall asleep often mm -hmm. so she, a, a lot of her um so she went from enslaved to like a free woman through the dream state like through the imagination like she actually was the instructions to get to where she was actually was a lot of time spent in a dream state or this imagination so she literally transformed through the imagination so I believe honestly I believe it's the I believe it's the primary tool um, of uh, of any type of evolution and um, identity. Mm -hmm. um, I my understanding is that there's one last question uh, uh, on HowlRound, and that we are, you know, we've got 30 seconds left, a minute left. Tom, did you want to ask that question quickly? Uh, yes, I hope I can. This question is from Mikhail. He is asking, isn't the whole point? Um, at least at times of modern puppetry, the relationship between the live visible artist or performer and the object puppet, question mm. mark? Mm. I guess, is that um, uh, a relationship which you all see as, um, as um, kind of present in the work that you've discussed or researched? I guess I would I would reframe that slightly because it 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 seems to me that a number of you were talking about um, the responsiveness of that relationship, like the nature of that relationship. I think I also want to expand on on that statement too to see myself also as an object or a thing, mm -hmm. um, and um, to see myself as a puppet. And, and the the means of manipulation within myself, mm -hmm. um, that relationship between both like thing as cup, but also thing as Jess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think also now there's not always visible artists, but even when the, the artists are not visible, there's some, they're made visible by the movement of the object perhaps. And I think that's interesting. Um, and what I would add to this question is, there's also the audience, 
like, right? There's that piece of the audience and there's also, okay, sure, there's a relationship between the artist and the object, but then there's also a relationship with the audience that comes into play in puppetry. Yeah, I love that. Um, I wish that we had all the time in the world to continue this conversation because I have so many more questions and thoughts for each one of you. Um, and uh, I think that that's always the best time to end a conversation is when everybody has their head filled with more ideas that keep them thinking. So thank you so much to each of you. Thank you to HowlRound and Paulette and Blair and Tom and Josh and everybody who made this possible. I'll turn it over to um, the festival organizers and thank you very much. Thanks so much everybody for being here. I'm just gonna jump right in. Oh, Blair, here, you jump right in. No, Paulette's gonna jump right in. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I will thank everyone, uh, our Zoom audience, our HowlRound audience, our panelists, our lovely moderator, Dacia Posner. Um, especially want to thank the tech crew, both at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and on the HowlRound side, for making our pivot to the virtual format of this symposium seamless. And then finally, I want to make a request of the audience, which is to make your friends jealous, tell them what they missed, and then let everyone know they can find recordings of all four Ellen Van Volkenberg puppetry symposium sessions on HowlRound. Those recordings will also be archived on the Chicago Puppet Fest website as we enrich it with new content for the 2020, from the 2022 festival. And then another um, note of what's coming, the young scholars from our panel will be adding their critical insights on the festival by contributing reviews of all the shows. We look forward to continuing conversations with you throughout the year and hope that you have, we have whetted your appetite for the next festival. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dacia. Thank you, Paulette and Blair and Josh and Camille. Oh, yes. You guys, thank you so much. That was great. Thank you for thank all you. Thank you, everybody. Here.